Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, or John. And uh, I'd like to introduce you all to John Hammersley. He's a, a founder and a C, and currently CEO of Overleaf. And uh, I'd like also to invite all of you for a conversation. Uh, Overleaf is, um, is new to most of us uh, that have used tech in other forms, in other ways. And um, so you're welcome to join and make this uh, interview a joint conversation and, uh, with uh, uh, everybody. Um, the first thing I would like to say is that um, Overleaf is a financial support of uh, the conferences. Uh, they don't have any uh, editorial uh, relation to us. And, uh, and John has not seen any of the questions that I'm going to ask him here today. Is that correct, John? That's correct. It's <laughs> blind, blind. So welcome to our conference and uh, hope you can join us here and in, in, in the future. Um, I would like to ask you first, uh, how, did you, how did you get interested in tech? Was it through mathematics? Was it through something else? Yeah. Yeah, so I did a, a mathematics and physics undergrad degree, um, and that was where I first came across tech, I think. We did it, I think we used it for one of our group projects in like the third or fourth year. Um, so that was kind of how I first came across LaTeX, and, and, you know, at the time it was just a nice, you know, I think someone else had used it, and so we just used it. It was just a nice way to, to write up the report that we were using and I, and I didn't really think much more of it in a way but then I did go on to do a PhD in, in mathematics at, at Durham in the UK and and it's just you know what everyone uses in in mathematics and so just got you know used it for my papers and um, thesis and you know it was very much just picked up from you know I installed MCTech you know got going you know my supervisor I think probably shared some files and so I had some templates to go on and stuff and and really like I used LaTeX for writing writing my papers and I liked I did my CV in it as well then after leaving you know deciding to leave academia um you know and I I kind of you know had used it for things slightly outside of the papers um and I was lucky enough to go into a job then um working for a company that was working on driverless taxis um, where we were in a research group and it, it, the company itself had sort of spun out the University of Bristol's engineering mathematics department and so again we were still using LaTeX internally and, and kind of in a way I'm you know, running ahead in a way this is kind of where you know Overleaf came out of in a way that, that research group then. So, so yeah I, so I got into a university. Uh -huh. So, so you were involved with other technology projects before Overleaf? Uh, and yeah, so I, am, I guess in terms of my, my career, as it were. Um, so I left my PhD and decided after that, I, I kind of wanted to move into industry because I just, I, did, I didn't really feel like staying in academia. I, felt like, I actually felt there was lots of other people doing really great stuff in academia and so many papers coming out. I, I guess I didn't really feel like I could maybe make much of a difference there. And so um, uh, my, my now wife was moving to Bath in the UK to do a teacher training course. So I moved with her and looked for jobs in the area. And, and there was this company doing driverless taxis um, and they were building the world's first system at Heathrow Airport. Um, I see someone spotted the Lego sets in the background. I guess I'll get onto that in a second. Um, but yes. So, so I was working at this company doing driverless taxis and, and it was kind of, in a way before driverless cars became cool, it was, um, you know, a few years, a few years ago and, and the group there, we were doing a lot of research into empty vehicle management. There was a lot of queuing theory involved and just vehicle redistribution and how you in a network, you know, make sure that you don't have a surplus of empty vehicles where you don't need them and, and how you can reroute them as needed without making too many trips a lot of the ideas behind sort of driverless vehicles was to minimize sort of wasted journeys and then sort of try and optimize 
um, the network and things. So we were doing a lot of research and, and publishing it. And actually, you know, we were starting to work. So I, when I'd written my papers at, at uni, I was just working either with myself or with other mathematicians. And so everyone knew LaTeX mm -hmm. to a reasonable level. Um, whereas we were now writing papers with people from other fields and other disciplines that were more used to Word and, and also writing for conferences or for journals where Word was the requirement to submit, you know, that perhaps wasn't an opportunity to, to submit in LaTeX. And, and so we were then, you know, both, like I say, trying to work with people who hadn't used LaTeX before. And, and I think, as we all know, like if you email someone a LaTeX file and they've not used it before, like there's quite a barrier then for them to be able to collaborate. And so that was really, I think, you know, where the, the original motivation for write LaTeX as we were we were called back then came from. And it was John Lees Miller. So, you know, he was the guy, you know, he's, uh, he is the, he is far more a programmer than I am. We're both mathematicians by background, but John is a computer scientist as well and a systems engineer. And he, in over one weekend, sort of, you know, developed the prototype for write LaTeX. Um, basically because Etherpad had recently come out and we were using it. And Etherpad was this great way to collaboratively write notes. And, and we, we'd actually used it for writing LaTeX documents, but the problem was you couldn't compile it. And so you had to then take it to, a, you know, move it locally or, or do a compile. And, and so really the first mm -hmm. version of write LaTeX was taking that idea of just a collaborative notebook and then adding a, a button to, to compile a PDF. Um, and, you know, and then things obviously grew on and out and out from there. Um, I guess I might just take a tangent to pick up on Sam's comment in the chat about the Lego sets, just because, um, mm -hmm. you know, I do quite like having this background and clearly it's, the resolution is good enough that you can see lots of classic space Lego. Um, you can see classic space Lego there as well. And then some M-Tron and Blacktron and bits and bobs around. You can't see over there where there's Star Wars Lego and, and, and many other things. And, I blame lockdown for this wow. and then going over to my parents' house and digging up my old Lego sets and then coupled with eBay, which is a source of um, cheap, cheap old Lego. I, this room is a tip. Um, I could try and turn the camera a bit without breaking things. Um, let me see if we can show it over there. So you've got the Death Star up at the top of the International Space Station, Saturn V. About it. Um, yeah, there's loads of Lego. A load of Lego up there. A hardcore technologist. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. I mean, I guess, so you, you probably saw the Saturn V actually. I think it was actually Probably. the space race that got me into um, science and innovation and stuff because it happens that my sister was born on the day that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set foot on the moon. And so every year, obviously, it was my sister's birthday. We also had the, the anecdote in the family that it was the same day, you know, back in 1969 when um, man had first set, set foot on the moon. And so growing up, I was very much sort of into space and space exploration. And you got to go, luckily, with my parents, we took a trip over to um, Cape Canaveral and, and saw the um, Kennedy Space Center and, and saw the you know, they've got a Saturn V rocket on its side, I think, or, you know, the, the part of the section. Um, but yeah, we should definitely have a Lego, Tix Legos package. I think that's an excellent <laughs> idea. Um, Don't give ideas to Sam Carter or, she, or she'll get to work. <laughs> and, uh, but, but yeah, I kind of grew up, like, you know, being interested in, you know, technology in general and, and I think the idea, like the pioneering nature of sort of what they'd done on the space race, and I think that's one reason why working on driverless cars was quite attractive, like after uni, because uh -huh. it really felt like it was something that was, um, you know, you know, yeah, like something that could change the world. Um, yeah. And then, and then actually, yeah, like with the right LaTeX prototype, you know, w one day, John, Lisa Miller sort of came around and, and we were chatting and he was saying, you know, people were using right LaTeX, you know, starting to cost a bit of money with the servers. And so, you know, maybe we, maybe it would be a good idea if we sort of maybe looked at it more seriously and, and decided whether we could sort of turn this into something. 
you know, you know cause we, we, neither of us had kids at that point. And so we could actually consider doing a startup and consider sort of doing this crazy thing of quitting our jobs, you know, on driverless taxis and, and, and sort of working on, on latex stuff full time, at least for a bit. Um, and, and yeah, and, but I, I think, you know, I've always been interested in new things. I think, uh, I guess not in the, oh, it's shiny and new. Um, but, you know, I've kind of got a book on my desk, the, the recent one, lift off about SpaceX and, and you know, what they've been uh-huh. doing, which is amazing. And uh, you know, it's sort of, um, you know, I think it's amazing uh-huh. all of this inspirational stuff that's, that's happening right uh-huh. now. It, so that was about what that, that was about 10 years ago John when you guys got yeah out of the it was about yeah it was about yeah eight or nine or ten years ago I think we know. first yeah I think the very first prototypes that John put together were in like 2011 and then 2012 late 2012 was when me and him sort of decided to quit quit our jobs at the time and then sort of go for it full time so yeah I know it's crazy I feel like Makes me start to feel old now. Ten years ago. So, 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 so your your other job now is is kids. You know, you guys have kids now. How how do you how do you balance those two things? You know, pre pandemic, post pandemic. If there will ever be a time, and how do you find time? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I love. So I've got two daughters, Julia, who's five and three quarters, and, and Annabelle, who's three and three quarters. And, and obviously, the, the three quarters is quite important um, <laughs> when you're in single digits. And um, no, I, I found it amazing. So I mean, first of all, I think we never would have started Right Late Tech if we if we had young children around. I think you know we it would have seemed like a crazy idea. But so I think it was good that we we started Right Late Tech, you know, which is now Overleaf and and it, in many ways, that has been described as like the first child, in a sense, because you are looking after this startup. Um, you know, in many ways, in a similar way to to a to a kid, and you know, it, it kind of it's very dependent on you in its early days. You know, it, you know, it needs looking after, it needs a lot of attention, and, and so now having had kids, I can now see that like the amount of hours. You know that John and I put into Right Late Tech in the early days. It's not it's not in the same way by kids, but you know you certainly have to have that time free to to dedicate to it. But no, I mean I, I think it's been brilliant. I mean I I mean a it's it's given me a legitimate reason to have Lego all around the house uh-huh. um, because you know kids kids like Lego. That's that's why we have um, we have Lego um, there and and you know. It, Pre-pandemic, I, I think that we're lucky in that our kids are young enough, and, and John's, is, John's is, is young as well, in that they don't, you know, that they didn't really notice too much. They have a bit, but they're, they're too young to have, like, had, like, you know, uh-huh. like, secondary school kids, I think, have had it much harder in the sense of not being at school and things, whereas, um, uh, yeah, we were okay. And, and with Liz being, having, Liz, my wife, uh, is a teacher or was previously a teacher and, and so when it came to homeschooling we were we did all right there as well because Liz was able to Liz was able to pick that up. Cool, cool, cool. So um I, I guess you know when I when I you know if you could switch a little bit to to overleaf you know uh, and, and some technical things when, when people look at it, they, they see a lot of different things. I mean, the, the the ability to, you know, to work with it without having to do installations, the ability to work anywhere, the ability to share a file with somebody or or even a, a large group all over the world is is is, is just uh, superb. Um, something that, you know, we, we've been looking for this everywhere over the last, you know, 30 years. You know, so I, I guess since WebDAV, started in the mid 90s you know people you know start sharing latex files and and doing um uh development together and so forth and uh and this it's just great that this now has formed into a solid you know solution for for all of us but then there are two, there's a couple of things that uh that uh you know that people don't see it right away and uh, i was recently uh, shown you know 
told by people, you know, how much they like that. One of them is 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 the automated processing. You know, the automated processing is just like fantastic. You know, you 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 don't have to worry about you know. Uh, what kind of indexes are you using? You know how are you post processing them, or if you're using BibTeX, or if you're using BibLaTeX, or or if if this paper is in this framework, or this other paper in this framework, and every everything you know is taken care for you. And uh, I think that can make. Uh, I mean, that has made a few of my co-authors lazy. <laughs> <laughs> they, they no longer take care of their own indexes, you know, and so forth. They just wait for the thing to be ready for them. And uh, and the other one is uh, one that uh, I have um, met, you know, about about four years ago, which is a continuous submission process into a journal, you know, in which ways you can uh, not just submit, but you can let the author work with you as it's going through the processing within the journal production as it's going through the book production and they just love that and uh and my question is you know how much up the sleeve you have you know what what, what are we going to see <laughs> uh it's is this many features i mean we we mathematicians are waking up now to the fact that uh that they can do submissions of via overleaf and uh, they're just discovering that you know it's 99 um, of the mathematicians you talk about there you talk with them and they they don't know about that feature they don't know about you know the journals which are in and the journals which are not in yet but tell us you know what is it yeah, coming yeah. our way <laughs> yeah no so that's great I mean, it's great great lead in to things and i think you know, certainly sort of taking it back to sort of the main benefits. I think certainly the one that we it was built for was collaboration, you know, and I think actually lowering the barrier by meaning you, you didn't have to install anything was a sort of a slight byproduct of that. It was, it, you know, the main reason for us to use it was to, to collaborate. But then, of course, as soon as it's there as an online compiler, like if you are a student, Who's, who's just been told we need to use LaTeX and you search for like, in, you know, trying to install LaTeX or you can just try it out in the browser without installing it. I think for a lot of students who were very new to it, I think that, you know, that really let them, you know, try it out for the first time. And, and you know, and I think that's where, you know, what, what I think having an online, you know, accessible through the browser um, you know, tech compiler has done is it just meant that people who have never used this before can sort of immediately see see the results. And you know, I think we've done a lot to try and lower the barriers for new users, um, while still keeping the I'll say the full power of latex. Not you know, clearly there are things you can't do on OP, but but it's it's still. You know, it's still a LaTeX editor. It's you. You can edit like the full source and everything. It's not sort of, um, uh, you know, it's very much focused on providing a really great LaTeX editor as far as we can within the boundaries of like what we can do, you know, with online, online compiling. Um, I should see. I mean, there's a, there's hundreds and hundreds of things on the wish list. I think, and I, you know, I, I think having now, you know, Overleaf's usage has grown and that. We have, you know, quite a lot of time is spent on actually just maintaining that level of service and trying to, you know, keep improving it. We did the big integration with Shell Tech a few years ago now, um, and I think that was one where we tried to definitely keep it as um, as smooth as possible for the users who are sort of using both platforms, like the original. Um, Overleaf and, and the new Shell ATAC and, and tried to sort of make that merge happen with the minimum number of, you know, road bumps for, for the users, which is meant that behind the scenes, we've had to do quite a bit of cleaning up work then to sort of tidy up the systems and to sort of make it all, um, uh, you know, bring it all back together again into a, um, something that we can take on. Um, but yeah, I think we've got a few things that we're, we're trying to do. Um, I guess picking up on the on the question of publishers. Um, like a few years ago, I think we did, we have put a lot of effort in with, with various publishers and, and 
you know, I don't think we got it actually as far as we hoped. I think we had hopes that by this point we would have a, you know, you submit to a journal, you know, it then, your editors and reviewers can then leave comments or, you know, propose changes or however, you know, depending on the, the journal and the particular sort of process and then take it all the way through and then the journal could then take the LaTeX on or you know, could run the LaTeX through a, an XML compiler and, and get a, you know, get the XML out for the, for the website. And I think where we, we ran into some challenges there is just that it is a very complicated process and, and all of the different journals use a lot of different systems. And, and also they do often, you know, most journals accept LaTeX and Word and so are looking ideally for a solution which works for both. And, and I think for us as being very focused on the LaTeX world, it was then it was then difficult to sort of take it all that way. So where we got to with a lot of them was trying to actually help make sure that the templates that they had, you know, LaTeX templates they, they had were up to date. Um, trying to provide a good way for authors to get going and then actually just trying to make sure authors have the files they needed to sort of take into the submission systems. Um, I think we've done a few notable like, exceptions where it did actually work really nicely. Like the, the best integration we had for a long time was with, with F1000 Research where their editorial team did leave comments and track changes for the authors in Overleaf who then could come in and, um, you know, accept those or make further changes and then the editor you know, could go through that editorial process um, as needed. And even that integration was a very early one. It was one of the first ones we did, I think. And, and you know, even with that, we, there was many things we could have, we could have improved on it. Um, and so, yeah, I think with, with the publishing world, I think where we've, where we struggle a bit is trying to not add an extra complication you know, not not somehow make the workflow more complicated in a route to making it less complicated. Um, mm -hmm. And so actually now, what, yeah, like I say, we generally focus on trying to make it as easy as possible, you know, on the authoring side and then on, on the submitting side. Um, there was a talk from Heinrich earlier on who, who talked about the, um, you know, uh, LaTeX to XML conversion, you know, that we looked into as well. And, and Again, ideally, it was something that we were hoping to incorporate into Overly so that you could sort of hit a button and get an XML output as well as getting the PDF output. And we've, I think we made a lot of progress and then Heinrich has made a lot of progress there with that. And, you know, and, and obviously, you know, with LaTeX ML as well and, and, and all of the other work in the ecosystem that's improved that there. We've not, again, it's still something that we, we haven't quite you know, worked out how how it best sort of fits in in a way. And I think one of the challenges we have sometimes is that, you know, Oakleaf is being used by a lot of people for a lot of different things. Um, and, you know, in the publishing world, like getting the XML output out is useful and, and, and it's useful in certain workflows. Um, for other, others of our users, let's say students writing group projects, like they don't, they have no need for the XML and, and it's something that's almost, you know, unnecessary. And so we sort of have to try and, you know, with the, with the development team we have and the product team sort of work out where can we, where can we try and add the most value to the most users or, you know, which, which bugs do we need to, do we need to prioritize fixing or, you know, how do we keep, um, you know, keep Overleaf up to date with the, you know, the new tech live releases that come out and the new, the new developments there. And so um, I see there's a question in the, in the chat about why is there still no, no Overleaf app for mobile devices? And this is a good question because we oh, first I, looked at this. I'll, 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 I'll like to precede that question which, with, a, with a preamble. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a question that I have asked the other two interviewers in this conference. Um, yeah. You know, right now, uh, Overleaf is the only decent tech that we can run on just about 80% of, uh, of machines out there in the world, you know, and uh, a lot of people say, you know, I do not need to run LaTeX on my car player or, you know, my car dash or whatever, but there is a lot of very powerful tablets, which are, you know, being 
uh, being straightly replacing desktops right now. And uh, Chrome OS is the dominant operating system distributed in the world right now. And, uh, and the only way that we have to achieve a, a, a decent and complete distribution of LaTeX is with Overleaf. Um, I, you know, and I even go as far as saying that, you know, it's important for me to have it on my phone. You know, sometimes I am at, uh, you know, not during the pandemic, but, you know, with people that, that the only thing I have in my hands is my phone and I wanted to be able to share a result to be able to share a you know a a display of a PDF that has been just produced by yeah. Overleaf, and uh, and I think that that's very important. But the problem is the controls of a web browser within a phone are very difficult. So it's when are these apps coming? <laughs> are these apps ever coming? <laughs> it was a great question. I was going to say, um, I think we first looked into doing an app probably in 2013, um, which is a long time ago now, you know, it, you know, in the sort of first year that we were really getting going. And, you know, I think for a long time, you know, for a good few years, um, because, it, you know, because a lot, like you say, because brow, because tablets were used and, and people would use the browser, like we, you know, really it became a question of, for an app, there's either two use cases. There's either, like you say, I want to be able to get maybe the PDF or, or get projects, see my list of projects, but not, not necessarily edit, but you know, um, be able to have access to certain things. Or there is the wanting to be able to edit whilst offline. Because if you're on a tablet and you're online, then using a decent web browser is generally, has generally been okay. And so what the kind of, you know, overly app sort of towards needed to coincide with was being able to use overly offline in in some sense you know you know a sort of offline mode and we we looked at this ages ago and i think we were it was something that we were considering in 2016 2017 and then we did then that was when we sort of merged with shell atec and, and we kind of moved into the sort of integration project that was bringing the two the two platforms together and like I say, we're still unpicking some of the stuff there and, and we're very close to actually having sort of completed a lot of that work. And then that does unlock making a sort of offline mode of Overleaf available. And, and it's still very much in the realm of, you know, to be determined exactly what that means, but the ability to sort of, um, yeah, see projects, you know, and, and at that point, an app starts to make sense because then at some then, then that point you have things that you could usefully use um, use an app for. So I guess that was a little bit of a waffly answer in that it's it's certainly not going to be in 2021. I think you know looking at an offline mode for Overleaf in some sort is something that we might want to look at next year, um, and whether that involves an app as well. Um, that's the kind of related question, but it, it becomes much more realistic, you know, next year. And I guess whilst I'm looking at the questions, so Vitz asked about Git and continuous integration and the fact that that makes it easy to collaborate. Um, and does this diminish the value of Overleaf as a service? And actually the Git and, and sort of, um, yeah, it is interesting because, you know, I remember in the early days when Write Latex first came around, um, there was quite a few people that said, why, why do you need Overleaf or Write Latex? Like you've got Subversion or you've got, you go get like you can use a local editor and you can collaborate with others and, and it works and and i think that's true like for it like for people who are familiar with that like it, it does it is very possible and and certainly yeah like you know github and and um has made it easier to collaborate on that kind of repository style um repository style way i think Overleaf just offers it in a different way, I think. And, and for people who are just getting into this and, you know, not necessarily computer science getting into this, just anyone getting into writing, you know, a sort of technical document online, um, Overleaf and just that going to a browser and being able to use LaTeX, I think helps more or is an easier path in than perhaps if you've never used Git, you know, or GitHub before. Um, if you've used Git or Git before, then I agree. Like some of the 
um, you know, then then that workflow works for you. But yeah, like if you've never used Git or GitHub before, um, it's yeah, I think overly pro probably offers a lower barrier to in. Um, I should say actually like this, um, I went to a talk given by Vince Knight, who, who actually recorded loads of overly videos ages ago <laughs> before we actually ever got around to making some intro videos. He did a load of nice snippets. He's, um, he's at Cardiff University. He's been sort of heavily involved in the um, sort of open science um, work there. And, and he gave a nice talk about Overleaf and, and the way he put it was actually this nice sort of triangle of, of, of sort of ways of using Overleaf. So you could either edit you know, online in Overleaf in, in the LaTeX source mode. You know, if, if you've never used LaTeX before and you don't necessarily really want to use it, you have the rich text mode, which is still in, it's still in beta on Overleaf. It's been in beta for a long time, but you can hide some of the code away and just edit the text if, you, if you're not looking to do that. But equally, if you have a preferred editor offline, like, and if you're already set up with all of that, then you can collaborate using using Git, using the Git bridge or, or GitHub to, to then you know push and pull things and 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 sort of sync with people who are using the online interfaces. Um, and I know none of these are perfect, you know, like the, there's things we'd like to improve in in the, the latex source editor. There's definitely things we'd like to improve in rich text and the stuff we'd like to improve with the the Git bridge, but it does mean that, you know, it makes collaboration easy between people with different levels of experience and, and different levels of comfort with, with technology and comfort with, with sort of different, um, yeah, like different collaboration. Wow. Wow. Any other questions for, for John? I mean, do you want to join the conversation? You can unmute yourself and, uh, and, and join us. It's uh, for, for me. It's uh, 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 we we just recently uh, had an experience, John, uh, with uh, the editorial services at IMPA, uh, a math institute down in Rio de Janeiro, and uh, we did the International Congress of Mathematicians about three years, three years ago, and um, the we have been working on this continuous submission process for a long time because uh, mathematicians are not acquainted in having their proceedings ready at the first day of the conference like the physicists and the astronomers and so forth and uh, so we try to coach them and to be able to work before the proceedings and have it ready for the first day so you can walk into the meeting and have it in your hands and uh, and that could, requires a lot of work and fast work and and, uh, and during the ICM three years ago, we had about, uh, about I would say about 80% of the people sharing their files on Dropbox and participating in the development. And, uh, and about only about 10% of them on Overleaf. This year for the Brazilian Congress, we had uh, 51 authors out of which 45 chose to do their sharing on Overleaf. It was a, wow. a tremendous change in within this three year time frame and and people are enjoying a lot to learn about uh, quality tech from the editorial and production staff. You know when the editorial production staff tells them, you know you don't use Equian array anymore, <laughs> and authors are very glad. Uh, you know, to ask why and and see their files changed in that way and see how it's better in that way. So I think it's a very positive change, and uh, this has been really, really great. Uh, no, that that is fantastic. Um, I see. I see Boris has his hands up. I just want to use um, Paolo's comment there just to to highlight something else, which I think really helped Overleaf over the years, and, and it's the fact that we have like, we have an in-house support team. Um, so it started off with. You know, obviously, as, as you have a software as a service, you have users writing in with, with issues or bugs or just problems using it, um, and, and it was just fantastic, actually. Like, it meant that we always had a lot of feedback from people, but John and I were answering those initially, um, and very quickly, it, it becomes a big part of, of what you're doing, and Liancy, and who, who I'm sure many many people here know, Liancy from the, the you know, later community, um, we put out an ad for a, a sort of tech expert to join the team and 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 the ANSI, you know, 
was just amazing and still, I mean, she's, she's still working with us now and it's been fantastic. And we've grown that support team over the years. Uh, and, you know, we have now have really a broad range of skills and backgrounds, you know, from engineers, to teachers to, you know, like, um, you know, people who've, who've done lots of different things. Well, because we have the support team in house, it means that if you write into Oakleaf with a problem, like you get hold of someone at Oakleaf and, and, you know, most of this, well, in fact, all the support team are really great with LaTeX as well, you know, different, again, coming at it from different um, backgrounds, but, but often can help the users and solve their problem. And I think this was an indirect, you know, benefit of, of having, you know, LaTeX compiling in the cloud is that it's not just the authors that can see it, but if someone needs support on it, you know, they can get it. And so a lot of authors who write to us and ask us for help, you know, and, and, and are happy for us to, to look at their, their projects, see if we can help. They, we can fix something really quickly and, and they, that gives them a really positive experience, not only of Overly, but, but of LaTeX as well. And, and, and it lets them keep going. And I think we've had a lot of, you know, like Overleaf has grown a lot. And I think, you know, it's helped, you know, it's helped people get past some of the, you know, the initial issues that you have with LaTeX and where you get stuck on something and you maybe have to spend hours and hours fixing it with the fact that you could either invite, you know, either ask someone from Overleaf to try and fix it, or I'm sure what happens out there, you know, with, with classes being taught and everything is, is people, you know, asking their teacher for help or asking their like fellow students for help and being able to sort of fix and spot, you know, each other's issues. And, and that was very much, if you like, a side effect of, of the collaboration is that it really lets someone else help you get unstuck in a way that if you're working locally on your machine and it's just you and you, you aren't in, you know, in a classroom with other people or you don't have someone else just going to look over your shoulder, you know, you, you've got someone there that can, they can fix it and and they, and you know that it's fixed because um you know it's this it's the same it's compiling on the same machine in the cloud rather than you know i could send you my latex file and you could try and fix it but then if if you've got a different latex installation running and stuff it, it might right, not be right, right. quite the same right and so right. boris you've had your hand up for a while i feel i should thank you uh, thank you i actually said this uh exactly a year ago at our uh, last uh, at our last online conference but i would like to repeat it now that as a um, old timer old time tech users i was completely uh, i was sure i never would need an overleaf so i never looked at it and in the last couple of years i found that it's so much uh, enhanced my collaboration that I now can work with people who would not go through the uh, task of installing LaTeX on their computers and they became, uh, or installing version control, uh, or something like it on their computers. And now they are very uh, productive collaborators. Uh, and the nice thing that with Git I can uh, just work on my computer and just use Overleaf as a big Git uh, repository, and they can use it for editor. Uh, I now, I am now convinced that what you did was one of the several most important changes in the tech worlds for the uh, for uh, for the last years. You probably. Uh, revolutionized the way that a lot and a lot of people are using tech and i just wanted to say that what you what you uh, have done and what you are doing is uh, absolutely amazing well <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to quite know what to say to that other than thank you and i think other than you know it, it's certainly you know well I, a it's certainly not just me i mean so john lee's miller you know, from a technical perspective, it's very much the, the first thing. But also James, James Allen and, and, and Henry Oswald, who, who launched Shell Tech, And I, actually, though, everyone, that, you know, you know, along the way that has contributed. I mean, we've, I mean, it, one of the brilliant things, I, you know, for me personally is, is we have such a great team at Overleaf now. And we, and we have had, even, you know, we've had people who've, who've, who've come and gone over the years. But it's been a really nice environment. And I think, 
you know, in, in a way, like, I think, you know, like the, the whole like tech community is very friendly. I think, you know, I think, you know, there's a lot of um, support given for new users and, and there's a lot of time put into the packages which help people, you know, in different disciplines. And it has always been open and, 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 and collaborative, I think. And, and I, I, yeah, I, 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 it's nice to see, I think, you know, Overleaf and, and you know, this sort of cloud-based LaTeX, you know, like helping, helping to sort of continue it on. And, and I think helping LaTeX, you know, be more accessible to people in, in the distribution sense of accessible. You know. um, and, and I also think, you know, the, we were also just lucky with the timing, you know, I think in many ways, and they say this a lot, you know, Dropbox had recently come out and there was a lot of other things that people were starting to do through the browser rather than installing directly. Like, I can't remember off the top of my head, but like, you know, well, things like Google Docs then came out after Etherpad and, and people just became a lot more comfortable or a lot more used to using the browser as the entry point for programs, like rather than, you know, like, you know, the, the you know, directory of locally installed stuff. And, and, and so I think we, we were around at the right time and, and you know, and yeah, and, and John's just, you know, I mean, he's led the engineering, you know, we, I mean, he and, he and Tim did most of it in the early days themselves. And we, you know, have John since led, you know, led the, you know, you know, how we've continued to build on that and develop along the rest of the team. So, but thank you, Boris. Thank you. I do appreciate that. Thank you. Well, if, if you want to join the conversation, you know, have your questions come in, uh, you can just come in online, any of the panelists, or, or if you want to raise your hand. Um, I think um, lowering the bar has been absolutely, you know, from, the, from all these features that we've seen out there. In, in being available everywhere, um, it's it, it's been you know such a, a game changer. Uh, the you you mentioned one thing which was um, the submission process, and the submission process has two faces. You know, has the face of the author has has to fit to certain you know certain uh, uh, standards, and also has the side of the production staff that receives on the other end. And has to make sure that, that that what he sees is what the guy in, in intention to write, and uh, and and overleaf breaches uh, overleaf um, bridges that that divide. You know the divide of you know yes, what I have it's here, and 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 then the next minute the production staff can continue to work with it and be sure that he is working on what the guy intended to, rather than you know some some display of uh, of a specifically russian font on a on a on an english manuscript that's not happening properly on page 147 <laughs> that's really great um yeah and i, and I guess the best one on that i think you know oh sorry no go ahead go ahead go ahead i, I was just gonna say yeah we did you know a, a couple of the publishers that we have worked with a lot of the years the ieee and, and the optical society um like I think in particular now, like the Optical Society uses Overly for compiling the, the the submissions that come through come through their site because I think one of the benefits sort of they found in particular was, like I think we've all been there when submitting a paper to a particular journal is you might upload the LaTeX files and then it tells you that it can't compile them, right. and it maybe gives you the error logs if 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 it does, but then you've got to, to figure it out and, and probably you're submitting it because it does compile on your machine. And so you've now got to work out why, why is it saying it doesn't compile on, on whatever you know, system the, the particular journal is using. And so like, what's really nice with, with how we've managed to get it to work with the Optical Society is like if you, if you go to there, we, so first off we work with them on templates and then we work with on the submission from Overleaf. So if you submitted it, from Overleaf, it could go straight in. Um, but now the way it works, if you go to their submission portal directly, which a lot, most authors do, I think, because it's the natural, you, know, you log into, you go to the OSA and, and try and submit. And, and when you upload your LaTeX files, 
um, we try, it, it sends them to us to compile. And if they do compile, then that's great. The PDF comes back, everything's fine. You know, it's, it's the same as it would do anyway, like if, if, it's, if it's all gone, gone through well. But if it doesn't work, the nice thing is that you get the option to open the, the project in Overleaf to fix the errors. And it means that like you and the editorial team can like could both see that to fix that or it, and it means that you know that if you do fix the errors here they're definitely fixed rather than you know trying to fix them on your machine when like from your perspective it it already seemed okay and everything and like you say i think mm -hmm. having that common view of of the document is actually is actually very valuable just for like you say not just reducing the like Frustration between co-authors who who have maybe got different systems installed and see you know mm -hmm. see different um, different layouts and things, but also for the publishers, you know, if they know they're seeing what the author intended to submit, then they mm -hmm. maybe avoid some of the miscommunication further down the line, or or even yeah, you know, having to sort of yeah try and get the author to fix fix problems which aren't aren't due to the authors the author's system. Um, what one of the just I think thing that I remember from it, it would have been a few years ago now on the publishing side, um, but definitely what because we used to get um, you know questions come in from authors or sometimes from the editorial teams. Like I think in a few cases we were actually able to help fix sort of underlying issues with um, let's say the. Um, the bibliography layer. I remember one where there wasn't uh, DOIs weren't visible in the references, and it was because the reference style had been designed before sort of DOIs were used. But what mm -hmm. the journal had been doing, because they didn't really understand exactly, you know, necessarily understand like the details of it, they were just asking the authors to display the DOIs, and so they, I think each author had to keep trying to hack in a way to to get the DOI shown and, and, you know, because some of those questions came into us and things like we were able to sort of actually, you know, suggest, in, you know, updating the, you know, the bibliography style so that it did that automatically. And then, you know, the publisher's happy because they no longer have to sort of have this frustrated authors who they're trying to sort of get to do a thing, which was really a problem with the template, you know, the, the journal template itself. Um, I, I see there is now a couple of questions in the chat and, and Jonathan has his hands up. Um, yeah. So Boris's question about the best address for feature requests. I, I would say always sending stuff into support at ob.com is, is the best way to get it triaged and um, and passed to the right person. And that's that support at ob.com is always the best email address to, to reach us with. Um, a question from YouTube, are we thinking to include Python tech in Overly once again in the short term? That is a good question. I know, I think what they're referring to is it used to work in V1, um, I think, and now it doesn't work. Um, I need to double check because it has been a long time. I don't really use Python myself. Um, but I will take that one offline and we will we will follow up. So if, if the person that responded on you, we'll try. Yeah, it was a question from YouTube, so I guess we might come on YouTube. Mm. Jonathan, you had your hand up for a while. Okay. John, one of the things that we have a hard time within the tech community is um, sort of have an idea of how many tech users are out there and, uh, and how distributed they are around the world and uh, who is really using it and so forth. I, I guess you have a much better but eye view of, of that action. Now, I don't know how much of that can you share with us, but uh, uh, can, is there uh, at least a, like a, a brush that you can give us of how tech is used and uh, and how how broad yeah I mean it is. I think it, I mean it is you it re it really is used all over the world and and I think you know you know we a lot of our users are students you know at universities and, and I think if you look at probably where there are technical universities or universities with sort of STEM you know big STEM undergraduate populations you'll probably get a good you know, that will probably correlate a lot with, with the usage of Overleaf because, you know, we definitely see, you know, yeah, like I think Overleaf and, and, and just cloud-based LaTeX has really helped um, students pick up on the use of Overleaf. And I think for students, it's particularly nice because it, it's a way for them to 
produce a, a report which maybe stands out, like especially if LaTeX isn't necessarily always used, you know, in, in their group projects or something, it's a way for them to show that they've learned something, you know, LaTeX and that they can produce this and, and kind of a way to sort of, you know, you know, get ahead of things. And so, yeah, I think it, it really is all over the world. Like we have a lot of use in the US, there's a, there's a lot of students in the US as well use in, in South America, there's a lot of use in, in India and, and there's a lot of use in, in yeah, it really in places, you know, across the world. Like, you know, we have we have a lot of users in, in Japan and, and, and there's a lot of, um, you know, Jap there's a sort of Japanese community around tech and, and, and who use we use overleaf a lot and um yeah i i it's difficult to you know i i do remember that we, you know we always seem to get once a year usage from the international space station but then that is just a good old april the first on, on google analytics for anyone who has ever checked their google analytics on april the first um yeah i, I think it, it's it's if you follow the student populations that would be the, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, thank you very, very much. Oh, I mean, this sorry, was, John, Jonathan, Jonathan still has his hand up. So. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm not Go quite ahead. sure. Hi, John, and thank you for coming to be interviewing, and thank you for establishing Overleaf, which really has made a big contribution to the tech community. But I, I sort of have mixed feelings, and in part it's because I'm an old timer, and it comes down, the mixed feelings have come down to this, that are trying to trying to find a way of saying it that causes the least offence. Uh, the tech user group has got had responsibilities, and I think still has responsibilities. And I feel as though part of Overleaf's remit has become things that the tech users group, uh, the tech developers, and the tech community generally should be doing for themselves. So the previous discussion of the distribution of tech users, where are the tech users? That's something that sort of the tech user group should know independently of the information you're kindly sharing with us. And another example is the strength of Overleaf, as you quite rightly pointed out, is that it provides a reproducible environment for the typesetting of tech documents. But um, you know, it's that that reproducible environment, I think, is something that the tech developers should be solving themselves and not relying on, can I say, the heavy resources of Overly, because that reproducible environment is hard work to maintain, I'm told. Uh, and the sort of way I see this, for example, is that a PDF document now has the embedded fonts it needs. So you can send the PDF document to somebody and they can read it. And similarly, a Word document, together with the Word program, has all the resources it needs. Whereas I can't send a tech document to a third party in such a way that they can readily get the resources they need to compile it and compile it the same. And I feel that that's a problem that the tech community, as developers, should be dealing with, because we want our tech source documents to be archival and not rely on the massive resources of Overloop. You'd like to be able to say, here's the secure hash that gives you the tree in the repository that tells you exactly what you need. Now, that's a technical thing, if you like, on one side, but those two, three things are examples, I think, where we're really grateful that Overleaf is solving the problem for us, but perhaps we'd be better off suffering a bit ourselves and solving it ourselves. So I'm not sure who I'm talking to and whether I've offended anybody, but uh, I, I, I hope you can accept, I hope you can all accept that I'm representing a significant point of view and I'd like you to comment and give your response. Yeah, no, and, and you certainly, certainly haven't offended me. I think it's, it, it is a very good question. I mean, I think, you know, certainly when, like I say, when, when a right latex was originally created, it was to solve a problem that we had within our research group. And, and I think it's I think it's great that it's helped, it's grown and helped so many other people get into latex and, and use it and, and sort of helped help latex 
you know, help, yeah, how more people become aware of it. And, and, you know, we certainly as well are very, you know, we use the take right distribution on Overleaf and, and, you know, we like a lot of the new things that people enjoy on Overleaf and new things that people have created, you know, like to, to pick an example from someone that's here, you know, Sam Carter's Tick Ducks packages, you know, like people enjoy that and they like using those and things. And, you know, that is, that is through the, the tech community. I think, I think from my perspective, like, like we, you know, I, I'm a researcher originally, I, I, I'm a mathematician, and I think it, it is important that we try and, you know, both, you know, not lose sight of wanting to get new users using things, but then also, like you say, things compile with certain versions and, you know, um, we've, we've had, and this is, I see where some of the discussions around you know, should there be a way of, of saying, with, you know, when something compiles, like what, what it compiled with and, and, you know, how you get that, you know, how, how you could recreate that, that exact document, you know, you know, what exactly did it, you know, compile with. And I think it's the point that, I guess the way I look at it is that these questions are important, you know, from a certain perspective and certain people and, and, if we can help find a solution, which, like you say, means that you know a LaTeX document can take with it enough information for you know from that to be compiled at that instant, and I think that'd be very valuable um, for a lot of people. They do, you know, they want to, you know, they're, they're looking to write documents and they want to, you know, keep them, uh, you know, keep being able to write them, and, and so a lot of the work we do on compatibility. So for example, when we release, you know, new tech live versions, you know, um, new documents use that new tech live version, previous documents still continue to use the previous version they had. So that from an author's perspective, you know, their document still compiles when they, when they re, you know, when they reload it. And so I think a lot of the stuff we look at from that user, user interface and user experience perspective is, is maybe something that can help with this, but okay. that, that was my, my first thought on that, and you know, it's definitely, it is definitely worth thinking about. So. Thank you for your response. It's very helpful. And I think we're almost out of time. There's one very quick question, John, about uh, support for context uh, coming from Vit Novotny on the question and answer. Oh, sorry, yes, I'm working on the, the chat box. Um, yeah, so it is a good question, um, and and like he says, like you know, there are some some interesting new things happening with context. Um, it's not something we've discussed internally recently. Um, like we do support the other LaTeX engines, but context is not something that we've we 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 have supported. And it's not something we've looked at recently. Um, it's certainly something that we can look at again. But it's, I guess it's not in the short term roadmap. So it's, it would be something we'd have to look at and then you know, take a view on. And, and given the number of things already on the list, I imagine it wouldn't happen immediately. But it's, um, if it is being used a lot, and I think if it is, um, if there are new things with it, then, then maybe it's time we have another look, another look at it. I see Frank has his hand up, um, even though we're nearly at the end. Yeah, um, hi. Uh, what I wanted to ask you your thoughts about is um, something like this. Um, when tech was originally sort of came into life and, and uh, Don wrote his book, he wrote something like join the user group as Appendix G of the, the tech book. And in the early days, user groups were sort of essential for basically everybody who, who was um, using tech, people got together to get things going and, and that was the way to do it. And out of that, the user groups evolved by providing services to worldwide users. Um, by that means they became less and less uh, visible to, to users. Most users these days have no idea where these services came 
come from that they they actually consume in, in all kind of ways like having Seatang run by by a handful of uh, people doing nightly jobs to keep submissions in and so on and so forth and the world turns and, and goes on and, and what you did with um, Overleaf is in some sense if you like a missed opportunity of the tech community as as a non-profit organization to keep the whole universe going and um, it's the right thing to do and it is the a step forward that we currently sort of have to keep the um, whole ecosystem alive and kicking and improving. Um, I, I think it is a, is a great step forward, but there is a foundation underneath which has or is in the danger, I would think, of at least partially collapsing. And the services that you are now providing and by this way, I think actually largely enlarging the ecosystem in some sense is underneath that run through volunteers that are getting less and less possibilities to actually get this work um, managed financially and otherwise. So what's your thought on, on how this is going on in the future and how much do you think are uh, companies that benefit from it like overly obviously in some sense because if that would not uh, be there it is not going to uh, sort of evolve further um, how is this going to coexist and evolve together in some sense yeah, I, I think it, it is a really good question. I think it is worth exploring like how we can help support some of the, some of the initiatives and, and even just not even the new initiatives, like say CTAN and, and which is an amazing, you know, like CTAN is amazing. And, and I think it's a resource that we should um, see what what more we can do with it to help support it from Overleaf. Because I think, you know, you know, we we make you know we make a small financial contribution, and, and I think we could probably do more. But equally, I think we we want to try and find like a you know a way to help it be sustainable in the long term as well. Like because I think that's the that's what we you know, that's what's the most useful, right? Like you know, it's not about short term um, things. It's about how, like you say, how we make sure that there is a you know enough people coming into it that will will help continue it and and, and how you know, how how it can be sustainable you know not just from a financial perspective but like say the people that are actually doing the work um but very open to discussion on this and, and to sort of i know we haven't got time now but like i'm very happy to sort of yeah it was certainly not really meant as a, as a as a question to resolve <laughs> no but it's <laughs> it is, it is worth but it asking, is something but i think, think uh, which is extremely important yeah. to um sort of get a joint discussion on it uh, in, in the future. I'd like to make a quick contribution to what Frank has said. The MathJax consortium, I think that's what they call themselves, have managed very well to get funding. And they're now part of the NoFocus group that funds a large amount of data science um, projects. And they get extensive funding from people who've got real stakes. Uh, I, I'd say that we have to look, to, as a tech community, we have to look to ourselves and the way we manage things. And uh, the tug has an income of $100,000 a year, and I don't think it's well spent. And it's very hard to go begging for money when you're in that situation. That's controversial, I know. Uh, the other thing is about reducible, reproducible document compilation. The remark the query about context actually made everything very, very clear. Uh, Overleaf is providing reproducible document computate, com, reproducible document compilation on a on a client hub basis. On a client hub basis, we have reproducible document compilation in the same way that um, Subversion provides version control. There's a hub, there's clients, whereas Git is a 
peer to peer. And I think the tech community as developers have got a real responsibility to develop peer to peer reproducible document compilation. And we do this with or without Overleaf, with Overleaf I hope. Uh, it will make Overleaf's life easier. And, um, sorry, I've lost my thread. Um, yes, that will make a lot of things much easier. It means that I can write a Beamer presentation and send it out to people just as a tech file, which greatly makes, redu considerably reduces the latency of uh, giving presentations, for example. So, I'll stop at that point. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, John very, very much. Um, we enjoyed this conversation squarely and uh, we hope to do this in the future again. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for inviting me and thanks for running a, a great conference. I have a lot of YouTube stream to catch up on. Um, I do wanna just highlight from the chat that Tix Bricks already exists apparently and, and Sam is, is already on it. <laughs> so um, hopefully if nothing else, we have inspired some Lego tech um, in the future. But no, it, it'd be great to, uh, you know, it's, it's been great to be here today and, and, and I wanna catch up on the other presentations and, and, and continue the, the wider discussion on all of this as we go. Thank you very much.